How about a hand for our panelists, ladies and gentlemen, introduce them. Well, thank you. And uh, you know, one of the things that we want to make sure is to uh, have a, the actual uh, personalities involved in, uh, in soccer here and in, in sports in general. And so starting with, uh, with Manny Lagos, who's in, in the center here, Manny is, was named Minnesota United's first sporting director in December of 2015. In his new role, Lagos will assume the responsibility for all player recruitment, acquisition, and development, as well as oversee the sporting staff on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I remember uh, Manny years ago and his father uh, uh, talking about uh, putting soccer in, uh, in the cities. They were actually looking for a location. This goes back, must be 20 years, man. He, he looked the same, baby. He looking good. You looking good. You know, the DNA, man, it's still there. But, but, but I think the important part is that, that, that determination uh, by, by Buzz and by Manny, it, 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 it's coming to reality now. And uh, we're going to hear a little bit from Manny uh, on, on what, what the, uh, what the uh, news is up at the Capitol. Uh, you know, we're very blessed here, too, uh, in the cities to have a, 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 a National Soccer League World Cup a player right here in town, and Tony Santa is that that fellow. He's born in St. Paul, is uh, is American mother and a Gambian father. He's raised primarily in Minnesota, and his multicultural upbringing and extraordinary life experiences have made him a citizen of the world. Um, his impact on American soccer was recently recognized by being part of the U.S. men's national team, all-decade team, and his selection as a finalist for the United States Soccer Hall of Fame. In uh, two 2003, uh, Tony created the Santa Foundation to leverage what he saw as soccer's unique potential to create positive social change for youth. And Tony's going to talk a little bit about that. So let's have a hand for Tony Santa. Tony? <laughs> you know, and, and last but not least, you know, the, the, the fellow that we're very proud of, uh, Miguel Ramos, who has um, I, I think has changed the dynamics about what sports teams do when they're committed to multicultural outreach, and that's the Minnesota Twins. And uh, you know, one of the great uh, one of the great experiences for our company, Aguilar Productions, was to be part of that of of that decision to have a a solid department that's dedicated to diversity and uh, to multicultural outreach. And Miguel Ramos is uh, was this this the right selection for that position? You know, man. That Manny and and uh, and Tony both know Miguel, and they they see what um, they can see what his experience with the Twins, um, something that they can look at and say, well, this is the way sports teams have to react to these communities. And Miguel is uh, was uh, very much a, a consultant here, very well sought out uh, consultant to uh, many organizations and teams before he decided to leave his own business behind. And, uh, and, and all the, all the uh, different roles he had, and to take on this role. And it couldn't have been a better selection, ladies and gentlemen, because it's not only Latinos that, man, that Miguel reaches out to. It's all, these, all the communities here, the Somali, the Asian, you know, the African uh, communities. And um, Miguel makes them all feel that the twins are related to them, and they're related to the team. So how about a hand for Miguel Ramos? So we're going to start out with, uh, with some news from the Capitol. Uh, and Manny, give us a little something. We d the thing was so uh, juggled up there over there, we didn't know, if we, did we get past? Is it over? Is it under? Where are we at? Well, well I, I think the first news is that uh, it was a wild weekend at the Capitol. There's no doubt about it. I don't know. Uh, this is the first time I ever became kind of a junkie of following the state legislative session. Uh, and up until midnight, uh, apparently I've never seen like it in terms of uh, – how they didn't get this bonding bill fat passed. But thankfully uh, for us, uh, our initiatives weren't in the bonding bill. They were passed earlier in the day, and, and now they are sitting at the governor's desk. And the governor is parceling through all this kind of uh, mess that he has to kind of clean up from the, what happened on Sunday night. But the very positive from PR standpoint is, is that uh, the ask from Minnesota United, which I, I really like to make a public statement about, uh, the current land that the stadium is going to go on uh, does not have any tax, property taxes on the land. Uh, this is a historic landmark situation where an ownership group has come in and uh, decided to privately invest in the stadium. 
and the ask was very minimal. And I think for that that reason, it was a very partisan support uh, for this mm -hmm. this legislation for us, which is just a little bit of property tax abatement and some construction cost uh, tax abatement as well. So, um, from us as an organization, and, and again, uh, these sports guys up here and everybody, it was just a really positive weekend uh, for soccer and, and, and one step closer to a stadium being realized on 94 and Snelling. Wow, excellent. Well, uh, uh, as, we, as we mentioned before, uh, the Sano Foundation, and, and again, um, Tony uh, deciding to, uh, to return here to his roots, to St. Paul, and, and, and uh, and do something for the youth, and we need that. Uh, as as well documented, we're struggling here with achievement gaps. Uh, we're struggling here with uh, a lot of uh, high school dropouts, and, uh, and 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 we need combinations of things to motivate kids. And I think um, Tony's going to talk a little bit about the foundation, and uh, some great news too. I understand from the Capitol, and some about some programs. Tony, fill us in. Um, well, th well, thank you. Uh, for having me here, um, yeah. So my my history through 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 the sport um, really let me know how the sports and the community can leverage relationships and and different uh, communities, especially communities of color. Um, so when I retired, I wanted to use the sport, but not for the sport itself, but for the outcomes that it gave me, and that's leadership and um, being a part of the community. So we developed the Sana Foundation, and uh, I think in I retired in 2010, and at the time. I was really anti-Mexican, i got to be honest with you, because <laughs> they were the big kids on the block, and, and they controlled CONCACAF. Um, but then we beat them in the World Cup, and my brother married a Mexican, and all my nephews and nieces are Mexican, so now we're all one big happy Wasn't family. Wasn't that easy? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, but since then, the program's it's grown from three people to, to 50 full-time staff, and we're serving over 10,000 kids in the Twin Cities. and. Uh, we're, we're in the public schools, and we have an initiative to have free summer camps for 10,000 kids this summer. So if you know kids um, that need our services or a community that needs our services, please reach out. And the positive news we had, we were up at the Capitol as well, and we did get a $1.5 million direct appropriation to expand our programming into Minneapolis and St. Cloud. And we also got put into a, a grant as, as well. So uh, we did pretty well. Well, they did you right there. Congratulations, Tony. Um, Miguel, I know that uh, you just returned recently to New York City. They had the uh, Baseball League Multicultural Marketing um, Conference. Now, I know that a lot of teams in baseball aren't, uh, they don't have the department you have, the, that component that's there every day, day to day. How did that meeting turn out? Uh, what, what, what did you experience and what's kind of the future of multicultural marketing in the league? Well, buenos dias, good morning, and that's it. <laughs> uh, was a great meeting. Was a good opportunity to learn about uh, what the Lee is committed and what the Lee, the Lee, the whole Lee is doing regarding marketing. It's a good opportunity to learn from other teams about the programs, outreach, commitment, and also was a good opportunity to see that I can't complain too much because we're doing okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, the wonderful news I, th I think that we learned from the commissioner was that they're going to open office in Mexico. Uh, MLB is going to open office in Mexico because we want to strengthen our relation with, with Mexico. And it's very clear that when the commissioner talk about, you know, we, we have so many Latinos playing baseball, uh, and, but the majority of the people that live in the United States, Latino and Mexican, and we know how too many Mexican players. That's wrong, and we need to change that. Mm -hmm. So we need to create the way that we can uh, work with the Mexican league and be sure that we can create a path that they can be integrated with us and we integrate with them so uh, we can have more Mexican, Mexican baseball players. And the commitment from the top is very important and everything that we do regarding multicultural marketing, this needs to come from the top to the bottom, not the bottom to the top, because it's going to be more harder. And uh, so we are very happy for everything that we hear there. Well, that's a great perception, uh, uh, Miguel, because uh, coming from the top is, uh, is um, much needed in corporate America, as, as there's a lot of, of uh, attendees here 
uh, that are depending on their management at the top to say, let's go after that market. That's going to mean the budgets are bigger and, and the opportunities are stronger. But let me ask you, a as we enter this um, major league soccer here in the cities, you know, we, we are known as a major league city, obviously, with all they have. But I, but I, I want to direct this to both Manny and Tony, because Tony has experienced World Cup soccer, um, that, that excitement, the, the energy um, of, of the different cities, Tony, you played in, and, and, and how, that, you know, how that needs to be directed here in the cities. And how, what do you expect, um, uh, Tony, as we, as we look at the future of how Minnesotans will react to Major League Soccer? What do you, what do you think that's going to be like? Well, you know, this is a becoming a, a melting pot, you know, community. And uh, I think, you know, it's the quality you know, it's the quality of the of the of the soccer um, and the professionalism of the of the team I increases. Um, it gets marketed more, so the team's grown, you know, uh, by you know, tenfold over the last couple of years, and mm -hmm. um, is going into Major League Soccer. And soccer in general is is mainstream as well. So I think they do a good job um, of putting a quality product out, and that, that's the most important thing um, when you want to to bring people there. But also then connecting to the community and. Um, there's still, a, you know, a grassroots feel about it, but with the commitment to excellence. And I think just being really intentional mm -hmm. about about marketing in, in these communities um, and letting people know it is here. And obviously being in, in Major League Soccer, uh, you know, you, you get the benefit of the whole league marketing as well. Um, and you start to develop fans in other cities, which will, you know, co-create um, some fans here as well. Yeah, so having that brand, uh, creating a brand nationwide, as, as I think Carlos was showing us that a lot of the Latinos, they might have five teams they love or watch. And, and well, but, but let me ask you, um, uh, Manny, um, because you, you were here from the beginning, you and your father, and, and, but I, what was, what was that, that short, brief period of time where we had soccer out at the old Met Stadium? What was that about? Because we were drawing, you know, 30, 40,000 people, and, and it was a short burst, but how did, how did that happen? I don't know if some of you uh, we didn't uh, realize that. I think it was back in the 70s, probably. We had this team out at the old Met Stadium, and it was drawing thousands of people. And what was that, and how are we set now as we enter Major League uh, Soccer here, Manny? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll kind of give a long-winded answer. Yeah, because, sure. Uh, you know, it's a subject I like to speak on, particularly in, in when I speak at, at conferences like this, especially when we're thinking about Latino uh, side of the business and the marketing side, we're thinking about the multicultural side, we're thinking about uh, you know, how uh, the sports can grow for the benefit of certain communities, and also how those communities can grow from the benefit of the sports. So mm -hmm. soccer obviously was a little bit late to the party in terms of this huge global game. Uh, it really came to this country uh, through immigrants, mostly in the 50s and 60s, uh, and really with that immigration boom from all over the world, uh, Minnesota was a part of, of the, the growth of the game in those day eras. It was a slow growth, and in the 70s, we started a league called the NASL. It's ironically the league we play in now, uh, and that league kind of started up and just boomed. It got all the superstars of the world. Uh, it just was not a financially stable league in terms of uh, longevity, but what it did do is it, it, it planted a seed uh, for the younger generations like Tony and myself to fall in love with the sport, and there was an older generation, I think, that uh, got exposed to the, the festive side of a soccer event and, and mm -hmm. how you can use that. Uh, I think tailgating really kind of became a big thing in the U.S. Uh, in the 1970s, partly because of the soccer and the multiculturalism. So, um, but I, I think it's different now. I, I think we're in a different era. I, I think one of the reasons why that kind of went up and went away was because there wasn't a base. And there wasn't a base in a lot of different areas. Tony just mentioned the product in the field, there's not a base. Uh, there's not a base because, frankly, there's wasn't anybody doing what Tony's does in communities to to build up that synergy between soccer and sport, I mean, so soccer and the community and sports and, and, and leadership. Um, and I think what's exciting about the sport now is, um, and in particularly here in Minnesota, as, as I speak as a native, Tony and I, again, grew up together, grew up very, very close, mile and a half from the stadium, uh, is that, you know, I'm the youngest of eight. Uh, I am a mutt, I, I'm Lagos, Spanish heritage. Uh, also African American heritage, also Native American, also uh, European. And uh, it, it's one of the things about being the youngest in that, you try to think about being a bridge builder, and you try to think about how you want everybody to kind of come together to, to do special projects. And, and for me in this moment, when you talk about Major League Soccer and the special project coming to the Twin Cities, 
I I'm so emboldened to give talks to people out here that are thinking about their growth and how they can grow and, and grow in this community. And it certainly is such a special time because soccer is this global game that now has relevancy here. And, and I feel everybody out here should be looking at this initiative uh, with a chance, whatever it is your livelihood, to be emboldened to use that leverage of, of the sport, of getting your community, of, uh, of this global game for to an advantage. Because ultimately, I can truly tell you, uh, most of you, well, I gotta be wrong here, but half of you in here are the young generation that's really driving the sport. The rest of you are like me. We're, we're the old ones now, we're out. The next generation is the ones that are really supporting this sport. And what's so exciting is the next generation is more, even more from this community, a part of this community, a part of being Minnesota first, and after that, their heritage and their pride of where they come from. So we're, we're really at an exciting time where that balance, I believe, of, uh, of growth of the sport and relevancy, combined with, uh, again, people like Tony, people have been putting really, really decades long time and energy of building up the community. It, it's a great time for us to capture very, very much like the Twins did 20 years ago when they really started to initiate these cultural, uh, you know, diverse programs to make sure the community understood it, it's not just one segment of the community that, that's involved in sports, mm. it's the entire community. Well, well put, Manny, thanks. And, and Miguel, you know, I, I have to ask you because, um, you know, as much as the twins have, have, have done the outreach, I mean, at a certain point in time, you know, we got to put the fans in the seats there. I mean, that's the payoff. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's why we do these things. But um, but I think the um, your experience of selling tickets in the community, I think there's something you can share out with us. You know, it's not as easy as, as it seems or because you've, you've dedicated some, some time and some commitment to the community. What do you see as some of the key strategic things we should be doing when selling tickets to, uh, to our, our paisanos here. <laughs> yes. Well, the first thing is uh, the twin was the first one to, re to realize that they're not doing right. Uh, the, the process to outreach uh, communities, minority communities, because they, they did many nights, Latino nights, African-American nights. I don't know how many nights, you know. <laughs> you know. We, we had Norwegian. We have a lot, a lot gain to do so many nights. But, but when you see the outcome of those nights, you see uh, people buy 50 tickets total, you know, uh, a part of those outreach and, and the tank uh, or investment and money investment was a lot. So they, they understand, like, then eight years ago, they said, you know, this is not working. You know, let's uh, open this uh, diversity marketing office to just concentrate in, in, the, in the minority community and be sure that we do the right things. Uh, I can remember my first meeting with one or part of the ownership, and, and the, he told me, asked me, what's your priority, Miguel? And he said, well, to, you want my honest response or you want my marketing response? <laughs> I said, no, be honest. Yeah. Well, my first priority is not sell ticket. Then I saw the eyes of many people, yeah. and, and he said, let me explain why. I know we have money. You know, I know we have challenge as a minority community, but also I know we have buying power. But why us? Why they're going to select us as a one of the top priority to invest the money they have left, uh, you know, to, to come to, and this case was in the Metrodon, now to Tiger Free. So it's very simple to me is we need to be sure they feel that we are part of them. We need to be sure that they understand that this is not one, uh, one time a year or two times a year event. So they are going to support us if they feel we care about them and we de develop trust with them. So that's what we did. So we have so many days, we cancel all those nights, and we say, let's celebrate diversity together. Let's celebrate what made Twin Territory strong. And uh, it's the people that live here in, in Twin Territory that make who we are. You know, as a minority community, we need a lot of unity and collaboration and support each other. So, so that's what we did, and uh, last year was the most successful diversity day ever in the history of the Minnesota Twins, where people from their community buy the ticket, it's not necessarily a corporation, I'm, I'm looking for that now, <laughs> but, but not, not, not necessarily for, com for a community like Ria Aguilar, that said, Miguel, I want to buy some tickets to support what the Twins is doing in the community. In addition to that, we, we saw sweet from people from the community that say, you know, I don't have 
the 4,000 bucks to buy a suite, but I, ha I know friends that we can share and divide between us. And so we sold uh, like four suites, you know? So, and, and that's, the, that's the, the beauty of the thing. Then when, when we did the parade in Target Field, was a rainbow parade. It was people from all community, Asian, uh, Latinos, African American, all walking together to celebrate diversity. And we have white people too, you know. <laughs> so, because you are, white people are diverse too, you know. Every person is unique. That's the message that we really are working with. That, and the end. This is a business decision. So when I came at the beginning, everyone said to me, from the president to the ownership, Miguel, you don't need to be worried to sell ticket. I said inside of myself, of course, <laughs> you know. And the end is business. I, I understand that piece. But the difference is we need, to be we need to be willing to invest in the community. We need to be willing to go to the community. We need to be willing to care about the issues that affect the community. So, and, and then the community is going to take care uh, about you only too. Yeah. You know, this is a two-way direction. And take time. It's not a one-year solution. Take time to build that trust. Well, I remember the uh, a year ago or two when you opened the field, the new baseball field on the west side in the heart of the Latino community. I mean, that was uh, that was really a commitment. But the fact is that that really opened the minds of Latinos, and I have to thank the twins. You know, I'm going to ask Tony a question because, uh, you know, in this in this um, in this day and age, you know, the, the a lot of the youth here in the cities, are, we've got we've got football, we've got baseball. We've got basketball and, and all these different sports that they kind of have on their apps and everything. You know, how do we? How do they? How do they react to soccer? It's such a, it, it's a, it's a hard game. Um, it's, um, it's, it's. Um, if you're playing it right, it's a lot, it's a lot of strategy. How was that first reaction when you started the Santa Foundation and started getting kids involved? Um, well, well, first I just want to thank M Miguel again for the work they do and just reiterate that. I think it is important, and I think globally the game is changing. And you know, I used to have a, a, a restaurant that, that failed, and the reason why it failed, I said, we can't spend any more money on marketing because we're not paying the bills, and it just went all downhill. Um, and I think when you realize, like he said, you you know, y your mindset has to be not on selling tickets, but on investing in the community first, and um, and being intentional about what you what you do. And I think as an organization, that's what what we did. Um, and we just said if we built it and we support the community, people will fund it because it's, it, they're getting the impact. And that's why we've seen the government step forward as, as, as well as funders uh, recently. So we've grown from, well, now 30000 to to three three and a half million dollars in, in five, five and a half years. But w as far as soccer goes, um, when, we, when we go into the community, um, soccer is already there now. When we first started, it was there were certain communities that wanted it and there were certain communities that didn't. And we didn't try to force it down anybody's throat, but we just tried to put positive people there. Um, and kids want to be around uh, positive role models. So they kind of did what the, what the adults did. And so as long as we put caring adults in their communities, um, they gravitated to them, and then that's what they did. And so slowly, um, more and more kids would be drawn to it because that's the coaches. But we also you know, realize that there are kids that want to do other stuff. And, you know, we're not trying to force everybody to, to be soccer players, although it, it's in my heart. So we do, we partner with all the pro sports teams, and we've done camps with the Twins and the Vikings and the, and the Timberwolves um, to make sure that, that we, as much as we want to think about what's important to us, that you really do better by thinking about who you're serving first. Great idea. And, and you know, Manny, I was, I was just uh, thinking about, uh, you know, my own experience with soccer because having been born and raised here in, in, in Minnesota, like I would say uh, 75, or, well, maybe 50% of the Latinos that live here. You know, we weren't soccer. We, we, we never played it. Uh, it wasn't around. I, um, and and, and um, I've grown to like it in a sense. I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a 100% fan. But, I mean, that's going to be the challenge because it's very, we have half of the city or a population is immigrants, and then you've got the assimilated. So I think, um, I think as we move forward, how, how do you perceive um, um, working with that? And then tell us a little bit about June 25th, because I think you know, you're going to get everyone there for that game uh, with uh, Leon. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think, um, again, uh, just, just not to date you, but, but right, right. Y your generation, well, yeah. particularly here, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Sorry, sorry. Uh, 
<laughs> you're you're you're, you're going to be in the minority, but the, the, the kids play soccer, yeah, and, and yeah. the Latino kids play soccer, and and uh, particularly they actually, because of the explosion of the game in, in terms of the uh, social media, in terms of uh, TV, uh, the kids now can watch more soccer than uh, anybody probably in the whole world, mm -hmm. even in Minnesota in this country. So you can get La Liga MX games, you get MLS games, you get European games, you can get Asian games, and, and I'll be honest, they're they're doing it. You know, I, I coach these kids, I see them, and they're on their iPads. So the, these kids are uh, very, very aware th of the, the global presence that soccer has within even our market in Minnesota and how important they, 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 the sport feels to them. So I, I feel very good about, uh, you know, certainly the participation and the knowledge of the sport. And, the, again, I, I think Tony and I could have a long discussion, different topic about opportunity and development, which is very complicated. We still need to get better at that. Yeah. But in, in terms of... Um, Again, it's by far the number one participated sport now in the country. The TV numbers are, are going through the roof in terms of young people watching it. Uh, and, and where I'm, I'm excited, and I, again, uh, talking today, is I actually flip this now. I, I look at the, the Latino market and the marketing, and this is something that Latino people, it's a sport that they've been marketing for uh, generations and decades in other parts of the world. And I can't wait for this to be able to be used the way it's been used the rest of the world because it, it really gets people excited in terms of how you want to you want to market and present this sport. And, and again, I, we could just look to our neighbors to the south. I was just took a tour there, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why in just a second, in Mexico, where it's amazing. The, the marketing they do for the sport there and, and the TV presentation they have and the ability to get people excited. Uh, I, I'm excited for uh, this sport to create the diversity and create the inclusionary pieces by, by what it's going to do. Uh, I was actually just down in Leon. Uh, we, we finalized a deal. We actually moved a player, a Mexican-American player from Minnesota. He was with us for a couple of years to one of the best clubs in Mexico, Club Leon. Uh, he is there now. He's, he's doing very well. A little bit injured, so he hasn't been played in the last month, but doing very well. And part of that deal uh, was the first ever game that they're going to come back up here and play on June 25th at the Target Field. Um, and, and certainly for me, it's, it's a huge sense of pride because it's the player that I think really developed his pro career here. He's gone on to one of the more historic clubs in Mexico and is doing well there. Uh, part of the deal is they're coming back up here with their great star-studded team uh, to play the first ever uh, professional soccer match at Target Field. Um, I can tell you, uh, Target Field is an amazing baseball stadium, amazing sight lines. I, it, it doesn't necessarily line up perfectly maybe on the field. We're going to have to finagle a little bit to make it work. Mm -hmm. But from a fan experience and what they do from a servicing side, we couldn't be more excited to have this be the first ever professional match there. And, and we know it's going to be a big success, a big event. We really want people to come out to say, hey, this is what's going to be coming more and more often to the Twin Cities in the future years. Yeah. Well, in, regard, in regards to that game, uh, uh, Manny, now the, the stadium, and thank goodness it's moving forward, now that wouldn't be ready till 2018 for that, that season. So are we to understand that our season might start 2017? Um, if, 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 if there's a, I hate to put you at the spot here, but I, but I, but I understand that there's two games this year. There's a game the 25th yep. at, 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 at Target Field, and then there's a game uh, um, in August at U.S. Uh, U.S. Bank Stadium. I'm not sure of the date. Yes, so the, the, the date at Target Field will be us versus Leon. August 3rd at U.S. Bank Stadium okay. will be the first ever pro soccer game in that football stadium. What I think significant about that, that's between two high-level teams, Chelsea and AC Milan. Oh. Uh, and what's significant about that game is it, it's very similar to, uh, to me where soccer is going when you have these cathedrals of, of, of sports. And I don't know if, if anybody's had a tour of that stadium yet. It is massive. You could put the old metronome yeah. inside of it. Uh, and and I, I look at the barometer, and I'm always thinking I'm myopic towards the sport that I love and, and participate in. And I look at the uh, another stadium that was just built in, in uh, Texas, Dallas Cowboys Stadium, over a billion dollar stadium as well. Uh, and the first event there was Mexican national team. Wow. Soccer. The first event here will be a soccer match. So again, it, it just tells me as we're growing this sport, uh, it, it, this huge global sport, it's becoming much more home to Minnesota. Well, how about uh, Chelsea? Are they, are they bringing the hooligans with them? Or? Uh, yeah. I think we know something about that. I, I don't well, know about that, but we there, there check are them at the airport here. fans everywhere. Yeah. You're right. Well, listen, we, we, we're, we're going to wrap things up here, but but I I, I think I, I think that um, you know, the cities are so excited about this opportunity, and uh, and um, as we look at uh, the fact that that the stadium actually landed in St. Paul, you know, St. Paul, we've we've had some success stories in sports. This is I think this is very um, um, 
remarkable that's going to be there. And I, I think that's great for the cities now. I think having two major league teams. But, but in, just, but just to give you a little yeah, story, Tony and I yeah. growing up, th yeah. that, that intersection of uh, Snelling and University, uh, Tony used to come over to my house and so we'd take the bus up to SBA to, to either play around or just to play soccer or do something. And, and we always, even at 11, 12 years old, transfer in buses, you had to have your wits about you in that area. And, and, this, and, th and I say that because it's, this is going to be transformative. It's, gonna, it's a $300 million investment into that space. Yeah, amazing. Uh, it's an amazing neighborhood. Tony and I have a great love for it. A and we know this is only going to make it uh, you know, grow. And like you said, it, it's in a great spot and a great future. Yeah. Well, I, I would think, um, uh, well, first of all, thanks, thanks for the panel. But, and we're going to have one final question for each of you. But I, I think as, as far as Aguilar Productions, you know, this is our 20th anniversary of producing multicultural marketing. Uh, conferences here, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly, uh, there's room to expand, and, and one of the things we're very interested in uh, uh, is, our, is our sports marketing uh, conferences, so we're hoping to have more of them, we're hoping to get uh, involved more of our corporations so they can see the uh, benefits of, of being part of the soccer explosion, let them know how that marketing works, because you know, soccer is um, um, kind of a, a, a sport that you have to grow into, but we want to make sure that our sponsors to be know exactly what it's about, uh, what's what's the ROI, how to develop that, so we don't lose them in, in a sense. So so we're hoping to work more with your teams and and Tony with your organization, of course, with with the with the uh, with the twins. But uh, so final question, each of Miguel, you know, as we look at um, as we look at the the twins and uh, and the um, the. The increase of Latino players, it's, it's been significant. I know now, now, for instance, that you have a, where each team has an interpreter now. And, 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 I, and I say that because, um, you know, as, as we're marketers, uh, I was, uh, we were having dinner last night and I was mentioning to our, some of our presenters that it's kind of unique that we have all these Latino players but yet we don't see the marketing increase of these players. We don't see it nationally, we don't feel it. Um, I don't even know if it's happening locally. What are those challenges, Miguel, as you get more Latino players, as you're mentioning we want more Mexicanos, but we're not seeing them on the marketing side. What, how does that work? Well, you know, I think everyone has challenge, and uh, we have some challenge too. Uh, remember this is a long, long season. They play so many games, and then maybe they have some few times, uh, you know, to be out and, and doing some marketing. Well, the, we have the responsibility to our fans and to our community. So we need to find that time. I, I think they bring the, the, translation, the translator guy because me, you know. I, just, <laughs> I think they, they, they said, they used the excuse because it was to the players, and maybe they don't understand my English in my own <laughs> office. But, uh, you know, I think uh, it's very important that MLB understand that this is a global sport and, and, and the Latino or, or any players, we have a Korean and who knows one more from Australia or whatever. We need to be sure that we are that, we, we're really ready to make change in the way that we play the baseball and the way that we manage the baseball. And, uh, and they're going in that, in that direction. But uh, one of the things I really, uh, Rick, I want to say, you know, I think we need to be happy and proud that we are going to have a professional soccer in, in Minnesota. Definitely. And we need to support that from all levels, you know, because it's one more opportunity that our community has something where they can enjoy and participate and also opportunity that I strongly believe is a good opportunity for job opportunity, economic development opportunity, and, and many things for our communities. So we need to work together to be sure the succeed of, of, in this case, uh, the thing of soccer team or, or, any other, or any other sport that we have in Minnesota that, that care about the community. So, and uh, in, in, ter in terms of baseball, you know, baseball had their own, ch their own challenge and they made many mistakes during so many years. Uh, we know the history of baseball. The nobody can say nothing, it's there. From the, from the time of Jackie Robinson. And, uh, but one important piece of that is we need to learn from our mistakes in the past. And we need to really create a new, a new road for the future. And then that road needs to be include everyone. 
I, to finish this, I remember when I started to work there, I say, I'm going to reach Somali community. Uh, and then I have people that tell, told me, Miguel, Somali don't play baseball. <laughs> so why, why are you going to invest that time there? Let's go to the Latino community. Let's go to people that play really baseball. And I say, that's why I need to be there. If they don't play baseball, let's teach them to play baseball. They, they, they may be excited about baseball, you know, and also they're part of our community. One clear example is San. San is here from the Mon, Mon, Montaigne newspaper. Right. You know, we can assume nothing in life. You, you can assume because uh, Mon community don't, don't, don't play too much baseball. We can assume that Okay, we're not going to concentrate our marketing effort in the Hmong community because they not play they play more soccer and other kind of sport. No. So I sank into my office and, and we talk about baseball. And then he said, you know what? My kid loves baseball. And he said, fantastic, son. Why we not can work together and you put a team from the east side of St. Paul together? I don't care if it's small or whatever, but can you help me to do that and to play in the RBI league? And he did. So the beautiful of Eastside Pride is the, the, the name of the team. The beauty of that is that you see mom, African-American, and white kids playing together in the same team. So what I did, just only try to support him the most I can, you know, and, and he helped us from the community to put that team together. That's what, what, this is what this is about. Mm -hmm. All together, don't assume nothing, no mis misunderstanding nobody, no, you know, because you, you're going to have a big surprise. You know what you can find out when you take the time to listen, learn, and, and make the implementation of whatever strategy you have. Excellent, Miguel. Very, very well said. Very well said. Uh, Manny, you know, as, as, um, as, we, uh, as we enter this era of, of Major League Soccer, you know, just, just briefly, you know, this is a dream for you in, in the sense that your goal and um, I think I think that um, that as we as we as we look back at the history there, I think we're going to have a big success. I, I I think there's enough groundwork laid out by Tony, by the all, all this uh, the the work you did at Blaine. So we want to first of all say congratulations uh, uh, for making this thing happen. But let's talk a little bit about about the owners of the of of the of of, of the new United FC. Why don't you just give us a little bit about the ownership and, and how they're dedicated and the, their unique position of paying for the stadium and that type of thing. Yeah, I, I, I think it's important, uh, again, uh, that, that you ask that question because it's such a nice question be because it, it really, when you talk about soccer, we, we were ownerless about four or five years ago as a pro team. The league had to come in and uh, operate the team. And, and really the vision of the sport almost went away. Uh, and, and one of the amazing things that happened uh, is that there was a, this this energy of soccer in the rest of the country and markets similar to ours started to have some success, and so from that uh, people are like, wait a sec, this this is a, a great market too, and and a little bit like what Miguel just said there is just a little bit about um, just how important uh, the sports can be in the community, and I think there was an acknowledgement by some really key pillars that I think that really do some great work in the community in this in this town, uh, one of them being the Twins owner. Uh, the Timberwolves owner, our, our current primary owner, Dr. McGuire, who ran United Healthcare, and, and these are people that live here. They want to be here. They raise their kids here. They believe that this is a special place, uh, and so uh, they came together and said, "This is why we want to get this type of investment of hundreds of millions of dollars to make sure that we have this great sporting landscape already: soccer, baseball, basketball, football, hockey, uh, great sports." And, and again, I'm I'm a native of here, so I. I I really would sit down and argue with anybody that it, there's a there's this thing called pride uh, that we have in this place that we support our teams through thick and thin. You know, uh, I support the baseball team now, and I know it's I've been there. I've been that tough time. So they're gonna they're gonna find their way out of it, but it's very tough even for it to go up in the community and talk when the team can't play way, play as well as you want to. But there is something special about this place where we still do find a way to support our teams. I think more supportively than other markets, and we have an ownership group that came together and looked at this sport and looked at this community and said, this has to be here. This has to be part of this. Almost like an art museum. They're like, we need to make sure soccer is just like these other sports, is just like having an ability to create, make this community even better. 
Uh, and, and that's what makes this so special uh, for where the things are going because it really was an impressive ownership. But there's a couple other ownership names uh, that I can't really mention today, but that are a part of us. And, and they truly are some of the pillars of this community that have, have helped create what we think is the special place. Well, that, you're, you're so right. I've been to a couple of the press conferences and, and that's dynamic. Finally, you know, in, in, in closing, you know, Tony, the Santa Foundation, the work you're doing, it's terrific. How do we, anyone in the audience that wants to get involved with what you're doing, how, what, what is the process uh, other than the check? Uh, how, do we <laughs> how do we connect with you? And, and um, if we do connect with you, what, what is the process where you would go to the community? You mentioned you would go to the community. What, how, what is that process about? Um, well, usually we get an email from, from somebody that's heard about us. And that people say, well, how do you know like, when, you're, when you're doing good? And, um, we start to get emails saying, you know, asking for help, and that means that the word's out there that that we are actually somebody that that does good work. So the fact that we get emails asking for help is is great. Uh, we we do distribute equipment for those who need it. Um, we do do camps and clinics. We also, you know, have over 30 mentors working full time in in 10 public schools. So um, it really is, you know, depending on what what your issue is, is it something in marketing? Is it something? Um, you want we we do exchanges international exchanges as well whether you want us to come and do a one-day camp or clinic at your school or a week-long clinic or just get um, uh, college recruiting advice I would suggest go to our website and look at the programs we offer and see you know if there's a need for them in your community um, and then reach out uh, we're always looking for other volunteers board members uh, committee members as well so there's different ways to get involved you know this young man in the front Christian I met him at a viewing party a couple of years ago, and he, he became very engaged. And um, I think it's you know it's helped bring his family together. Um, and uh, so uh, just through we we do a lot of stuff in the community where it's just fun to be a part of, and um, we give our resources and for for good outcomes as well. So we I'd like to think it's a positive environment, and uh, but we are here to help. So the the best thing is just to look at our website and and, and try to understand what we do, and and or just you know, send us an email asking to set up lunch, w and it might be with me or one of my colleagues to see how we can work together and, and support uh, important community initiatives. Let's have a hand for the panel, ladies and gentlemen. Yes.